<laughs> okay. And we had a, before we, we start, we had a meeting in the Waynesboro Church. Some of you were there in the Waynesboro Church about our music. And somebody asked a very good question. They said, as uh, the philosophy of music in the Waynesboro Church was being shared, they said, well, what is your standard? You know, the lady that's uh, our, our music, uh, music, uh, what do you call her? Director. Music director, music, whatever. She basically approves the music in the church. And the question was, you approve it based on what? What you think or what, you know, what, what is your standard? I thought, good question. You know, you like R&B, you like reggae, you like Ozzy Osbourne, you like whatever you like. Why do you like it? Is there a right and is there a wrong? This is our subject this morning. I'm going to take about six or seven hours. I'm going to have a helper in this class, Christian Berdahl. Now, I worked with him in uh, Ukraine. I'm going to show you in each class a few minutes and Ibra Myers and some other people. I'm not saying these men are experts. I'm just saying they said something I want to include in the class. And this morning, uh, part of my class, the subject, is something Christian Bardal dwelt on. Not what he said, it was his opinion. He played it. He said, listen to this. And then uh, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, it's, it's just now ready to start. Our Father in Heaven, bless us this morning as we pursue the subject of uh, truth in regards to music worship. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, idol worship. Now, today, it's not just calves. Now, the, the question that we're going to give study to, do, does the music convey it? Wait, let me, let me take that back. Do the words and the music convey a message? Yes. You take the words out. Does the music itself convey a message? Yes. Okay. So, the music, apart from the words, does it, in and of itself, have a message? Yes. That's the question, right? The church is God's fortress. Now, there are two locations designated by the Bible. John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. John 18, verse 11, Peter, put up the sword. Why, Lord? Matthew 26, 52, if you live by the sword, what? Finish it for me. Now, when you come into the church, you're supposed to leave the world. The church is the fortress is the boat. Sister Aisha, read for us. The church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. Now, if you bring the world into the church, if the water comes into the boat, the boat sinks. sinks. If you bring the world's music into the church, the church sinks. sinks. Isaiah 2 verse 8, their land is full of idols. They worship the works of their own hands. Mm -hmm. This morning, idol worship, music, and music and lyrics, do they both convey a message? I'll read this one, and then Sister uh, Addie, you read the next one. In educational lines, many ideas are advanced. Well, this is education. I thought our subject was music. You wait two minutes. Uh, in educational lines, many ideas are advanced, which proceed not from the high and holy one who inhabiteth eternity, but from those who make scholastic studies an idol, can your education be an idol? Yes. yes. And worship a science that divorces God from the education. Now, Sister Addie? They make their books their idol and are willing to sacrifice health and spirituality in order to obtain an education. So, mm -hmm. can education be an idol? Yes. I mean, anything could be an idol, right? Yeah. Anything could be an idol. So, uh, I hope you don't read Rolling Stone. I had to censor the cover. Is that okay? Oh. Sister Mara, I had to censor the cover again. <laughs> it's Luke Key's censor job. Now, because I say the appearance of idols today is changed. No longer a golden calf being cut open, right, and bleeding. It's, uh, this is headline on Rolling Stones, idol worship. So, the, uh, it looks a little different today, doesn't it? No more golden calves now. Sister Marie. Music is the idol which many prophets Sabbath keeping Christians worship. Now, can you leave the world and bring your idolatry, idolatrous music with you? Yes. Where is that music? Luke 6.45, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth sings. And uh, Luke 17.32, remember Lot's wife. She came out of Sodom. But her heart stayed in the city. What is BSS? Voice and speech and song. So, first step 
We take it today, Isaiah 117, learn to do well. We're learning about music today. And I tell you, we need to know, because unless Jesus is leading the choir, you're in a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Does God have a musical mind? Yes. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, the same mind it was in. Christ Jesus. Does the devil have a musical mind? Does the Bible teach that? Yes, it does. Here's one place, Daniel 3, verse 5. All right, we're into the, uh, we're into the 70 Adventist, three angels message. We talk about Revelation 13, which is uh, reflected in Daniel 3. Daniel 3, you see some men, you see a beast, you see an image, and you hear some what? Music. music. Plenty of music in Daniel 3. Is it associated with devil worship? Yeah. Yes. Daniel 3, mm -hmm. verse 5. Right. Idol worship and music go hand in hand. Sister Mara? When you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image. Now, let's reason together. Isaiah 117, learn to do well. Isaiah 118, let's reason together. Nebuchadnezzar was not subtle. Mm -hmm. He said, you do it or you die. Mm -hmm. What kind of music was he playing? Stand up, stand up for Jesus? <laughs> Come on. Well, no. What was he playing? Don't know. But when you hear it, yeah. You fall down, right? Yeah, yeah he wasn't playing. Uh, now, I'll read. Matthew 14, 6. Herodias was not like Nebuchadnezzar. She was a subtle schemer. Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar was a bold in what he did. She was more sly. Mm -hmm. Th thank you. Subtle. Mm -hmm. Second, first Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. The devil was subtle. And what did he do? Stole the simplicity that was thrown in Christ Jesus from Eve. But when her, Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Now, didn't have the power of Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. but she had his music. Mm -hmm. And did that do the job? Yeah. So let's uh, look at Israel. When Balaam looked at the Israelites in their tents. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Perfect order. Couldn't curse them. Balaam gave the payoff, but he couldn't curse Israel. Mm -hmm. Balaam said, I got to pull these Israelites away from God. Mm -hmm. How? He sent the, the woman and the music. And the music. Both. The women and the music. music. Sister Marcy, you want to read that one? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Page 454, at Balaam's suggestion, a grand festival in honor of their gods was appointed by the king of Moab, and it was secretly arranged that Balaam should induce the Israelites to attend. He was regarded by them as a prophet of God, and hence had little difficulty in accomplishing his purpose. Now, is there a certain kind of music that makes a man mad? Yes. 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 I mean, read great numbers of the people joined him in witnessing the festivities. They ventured upon the forbidden ground and were entangled in the snare of Satan, beguiled with, there it is, and music and dancing. Wow. So yeah, it's true, they sent the ladies in, but what were the ladies doing? Evidently they were, if, uh, yeah. like, what, how, back one? It was just like Salome, right? Patriarchs and Prophets 454. Yeah. Here's the plan. They ventured upon the forbidden ground and were entangled in the snare of Satan, beguiled with music and dancing and allured by the beauty of heathen vessels. They cast off their fealty, their loyalty, their devotion to God, to Jehovah. Same as here in Matthew 14, 6, but this is the Old Testament, right? Now, this is, uh, by the way, you know, the music... I used to listen to before I came into the church. Here you got fusion and, and punk rock. You got all these things. They didn't have that when I was growing up. <laughs> you know, you know, you got all these things today. When I was growing up, what did they have? Rock and roll. Thank you. This way, rock and roll. Now you don't know because you're not my age, but I was a decade, but two decades before you. It was rock and roll, right? That's all we had. 
Mm -hmm. Ozzy Osbourne was playing a chainsaw when he bite the heads off of chickens. But basically what he was doing was playing rock and roll. It was kind of a, you know, it was kind of a chainsaw rock and roll, but that's what I did. That's what I listened to. This was as foreign to me back then as the East is from the West. I had speakers the size of uh, that cabinet, and uh, it, it, would shake, it would shake the house to play it. I'm not going to tell you what I used to listen to, although I'll play little pieces of it, just little short pieces. And uh, now, Joshua and Moses are about to have an experience. And Moses and Joshua came down from the mount. What were they doing up there? Communing with the Lord. I like that. What did Moses bring down from the mountain? The Ten Commandments. They heard the shouts and the outcries of the excited multitude, evidently in a state of wild uproar. Don't read the rest. Joshua heard that. He said, this has got to be what? War. It sounds like a war down there. Mm -hmm. Is there a music to make men mad? Mm -hmm. To a man like Joshua, it sounded like, war. did he know something about war? Yes. yes. <laughs> to Joshua, the soldiers, to Joshua, the soldier, the first thought was, people are being attacked <laughs> from the enemy. There is the noise of war in the camp, he said, but Moses judged more truly the nature of the commotion. The sound was not that of combat, but of revelry. Mm -hmm. It is not the voice of them that shout for the mastery, neither is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing, do I hear. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, an introduction. Is music a weapon in the devil's arsenal to destroy the Israelites and us? Yeah. Yes. And I don't want to sound like a fanatic. I'm just trying to be biblical. So I want to play you something from Christian Berdahl. Let me tell you where this came from. It was the National ASI Convention, Adventist Services and Layman's Industries. It was the uh, National uh, Convention of ASI Church Organization. They invited him to come and share 90 minutes about music. And after he shared it, he put it on a video on YouTube. Some of you have seen parts. It's called The Distraction Dilemma. It's 90 minutes long. I just cut a short piece out of it. But he examined something. What I like is what he did is he gave examples. And he let you choose. He didn't say anything. He said, listen to this, listen to this. Now you tell me. So... My name is Christian Berdahl, and we're going to spend a little over an hour together. And what I'm going to attempt to do, as my friend uh, Neb said, was I'm going to attempt to make sense out of a very large subject. Uh, in fact, the, the, the shortest time I could compact it down for it to still make sense was 12 hours. So our five DVD set is 12 hours of education. And when you go through that course, um, it's amazing how you'll come out on the other end. In fact, we have young people. We've had amazing testimonies of academies, every student buying their own copy so they can take it home and watch it with their parents. Praise God. So I'm going to try to compact this down to a little over an hour, and I'm going to have to move right through. So I'm simply calling this the uh, music overview because we're not going to get through all the material. So let's jump right in. I would like to have an additional word of prayer real quick, though. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask that you would put your hand over this entire seminar. We know that the devil does not want us to chase this rabbit. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to expose the dangers that you have revealed to us in just one area of life, music. And Lord, I ask that you would bless us with the Holy Spirit. Even the samples that we listen to, help us to be educated by them and not entertained. In Jesus' name, we plead for the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, a couple big questions in the Christian world. And one is, is music moral or amoral? So, there are proponents on one side saying, doesn't matter what we listen to, music is amoral. Others say, no, wait a minute, music is moral, and it does matter what we listen to. So are both sides right? 
The reality is, no, they're not. Another big question that we have is, is it just the lyrics that matter most? Or is it the music bed that matters most? So we have two main questions. Is it moral or amoral? And is it the lyrics or the music bed that matters most? So we're just going to take two of the questions out of the entire seminar, and we're just going to look at that today. So let's see what some people in the contemporary Christian music movement say. Sandy Patty. Music is a very powerful force. It has a way of breaking down barriers. Is she right? Absolutely. But a lot of artists are taking that very powerful tool and putting negative, horrible lyrics to it, and those lyrics are getting into the hearts of the listeners and shaping their values. Is she correct there as well? Yes. Why can't we, for example, contemporary Christian musicians, take that same powerful force music and put positive lyrics to it and begin shaping values that way? Is there anything wrong with what she's saying? No. However, she's limiting what she's saying. What's she limiting it to? She is limiting it to the lyrics. And that is what most every single contemporary Christian music artist does. They say, it doesn't matter the music bed, what style it is. It's just the actual lyrical content that matters. David Meese, another CCM artist, uh, back in the uh, 80s and early 90s, he says this, basically you have to focus on the lyrics and what the song is saying. That is my criteria to decide whether the song is right or wrong. It has nothing to do with the music style, it has to do with the lyrics, what the song is saying, what are the words saying. As Christians, we can objectively judge it from that standpoint. Again, this is the mantra. It's only the lyrics. And if you have Jesus lyrics, it doesn't matter what type of music you listen to. Now, conversely, we can look at someone like Professor Marshall McLuhan, and he has a very different view on this. Now, understand that his work is viewed as the, one of the cornerstones, uh, 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 cornerstones work on media. He's a professor, philosopher, and a scholar. He's no longer with us. But here's what he said. The medium is the message. That is to say, the music, its melody, harmony, and rhythm, all by itself, disposes a man to virtue or vice by moving the emotions. Okay? So we have one side, the Christian saying, no, it's just the lyrics. And then we have uh, academia and science saying, no, it's the way that the actual music, the melody, harmony, and rhythmic structures alone move the man. And they're even using the word virtue or vice by moving the emotions. Therefore, the way in which they move the passions should serve as a principal basis for judgment on whether any given piece of music is good or bad. Does that make sense? So what he's saying is, it has nothing to do with the lyrics. It actually has to do everything with the music bed. Brain specialist Dr. Richard Pellegrino said, he said that he declared that music had the uncanny power to, quote, trigger a flood of human emotions and images that have the ability, listen, to instantaneously produce very powerful changes in emotional states. So he's saying, instantaneously, music can change emotional states. Take it from a brain guy, in 25 years of working with the brain, I still cannot affect a person's state of mind the way one simple song can. So what he's saying is, the music is so powerful, I can change, as a scientist, I can change the emotional state of a person quicker than if I go through even a therapy session with them. Maybe they're sad, depressed, and instead of talking for an hour and spending $150, let me to play a happy song, I can change your emotional state like that. And that's powerful. In fact, music is medicine, and we'll get into that a little bit as we progress. So, can music alone influence the listener? Let's do an experiment. I'd like you to close your eyes in just a moment, and when you close your eyes, I want you to listen to the music, to the piece of music I'm going to play. And then when we're done, I want you to raise your hand and tell me, as I call on you, how that made you feel. Are we ready? Okay, close your eyes. Okay, someone raise your hand and tell me how that made you feel. Yes. Happy. happy. Okay. Happy. Yes. Playful. Yes. 
carefree. Now, listen to this. I'm a prophet. Watch. Ready? You are going to say happy and fun. <laughs> now, how did I know that? Am I a prophet? No, I'm not. Not even a son of a prophet. But how did I know this? I knew this because music is a language. And if you simply understand the language, you'll know what everyone's going to feel. So is this moving our emotions and our feelings and our thoughts? Indeed it is. Okay, let's, let's close our eyes again. Ready? Here we go. We're going to do this again. Close your eyes. I said close your eyes. Okay, here we go. Ready? Okay, raise your hands, how'd that make you feel? Yes. Unsettled, Unsettled. yes. Chills. Chills up and down your spine. Yeah, you and me both, yes. Cautious, Cautious. yes. Sad. Sad, anyone else, yes. Something bad was gonna happen. Isn't that amazing? From young to old, we're all going ee! How'd that make you feel? Fearful. Look, at, isn't that incredible that we all knew that that was eerie, it was scary, it was fearful, that something bad was going to happen. I'm sorry, what lyrics told you to feel that? Hmm, that's interesting. There's no lyrics. You see, music is a language and we respond to it. What's interesting is, I w we don't have time to get into it, but if you go around the world, and they have, when you look at color and listen to music, everybody responds, neurologically speaking, identically. Now, emotionally, we might respond a little differently, but even pretty much, not exclusively, pretty much universally, everyone even responds emotionally the same to music. Isn't that amazing? One more, ready to go, here we go. Close your eyes, one more. Okay, now, without raising your hands, give me a verbal expression on the count of three of how that made you feel. One, two, three. Ah, amen? Isn't that amazing? And that's nothing you probably didn't know, but there was no lyrics there that said, please feel relaxed. You're being relaxed. Relax your toes. It didn't say any of that. You just started to relax. And so, neurologically speaking and physiologically speaking, we react largely the same way. Peaceful, tranquil. Dr. Norman N. Weinberger, professor of neurobiology and behavior at UC Irvine, his research confirms that, quote, music can rapidly and powerfully set moods and do so in a way not easily attained by other means. Now what's amazing is science is finding out, wow, music is so powerful. It can set moods and trigger an, a, a flood of emotions even, like that. Now let's bring it all together. The question is, were your thoughts being impressed and influenced by the music, yes or no? Yes. yes. Were your feelings being impressed by the music, yes or no? Yes. yes. Let's tie it together with the Spirit of Prophecy statement. Review and Herald, April 21, 1885. If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. And the thoughts and feelings combined make up the what? Moral character. Okay, did you catch that? You see, what that's saying is the thoughts and feelings combined make up the moral character. Therefore, if we're listening to things that shape our emotions and our thoughts, therefore, music is very moral. Amen? It's really that easy. If it's shaping our thoughts and our emotions, our feelings, then it becomes a very moral component. So for anyone to make the claim and the argument that music is amoral, of no moral weight or value or, or anything in our lives, it is a careless and reckless statement. For those who are educated on the subject, scientifically and biblically and by the spirit of prophecy, then we know that that statement is not true. Music is very moral. If it moves me to satanic influence and action, it's very moral. If it moves me toward uh, wanting to be with God and something that's uplifting and ennobling and edifying, it's very moral, amen? 
When we decide that as Christians we are not required to restrain our thoughts and feelings, it doesn't matter what I listen to. I can listen, as long as that's Jesus, lyri Jesus lyrics and it's called Christian music, I'll listen to whatever I want. I don't need to restrain my thoughts and feelings. Let it go. Wait a second. According to the prophet, not Christian Berdahl, when we decide that as Christians, we are not required to restrain our thoughts and feelings. We are brought under the influence of evil angels. And we invite their presence and their control. So what can we say about this? Does this, if we actually interpret this, it doesn't even need interpretation, it's clear. But let's read what it's actually saying and apply it to music. If we're saying, I can listen to whatever I want or watch whatever I want, don't apply it just to music. These principles are, are universal in our walk as Christians. The reality is, if we're not restraining those thoughts and we're just allowing the music to take us wherever and it's inappropriate, we are brought under the influence of evil angels. Is that what it says? Yeah. And we invite their presence and control. In other words, possession. I don't want that by the devil. I'd love to be possessed by God. I am his possession. Amen. Amen. So did God create music to influence our thoughts and feelings? Yes or no? Absolutely. There's nothing wrong if a piece of music actually influences you and touches your emotions. We just need to be careful of what it's doing. I know people that when they're sad, they'll listen to sad music. Right? Have anybody ever, come on, be honest with me. If you've had your heart broken, you've been depressed, you've been sad, have you ever listened to sad music? What is wrong with us? Wouldn't you think the antidote is what we should have? Happy, if you're sad, listen to happy. Amen? But we're like, no, misery loves company. Amen? And the little poor young ladies or even older ladies like, oh, he broke my heart and he stabbed my heart with a knife. And then we listen to music and go, P -p -p put 10 more knives in. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> we're just killing ourselves, emotionally speaking. Can anybody relate to what I'm saying? You see, we're not even using music in a way that's healthy. We got to be careful. Has Satan left music alone? Absolutely not. If we think that God, Satan has left the music alone, we are so deceived and naive, it's, it's, it's not even funny. The reality is the devil has not left music alone. He's gotten in and he's messed with a whole bunch of it. The Enjoyment of Music, an amazing book um, written by Joseph uh, Michaelis. Here's what he says. Rhythm is the element of music most closely allied to body movement, fleshly carnal, to physical action. Its simpler patterns, when repeated over and over, which is exactly what rock does, can have a hypnotic effect on us. The power of sound, they've also shown, study and research has shown, that driving drum rhythms in excess of three or four beats per second will put a, the brain into a state of stress, regardless if the listener likes or dislikes the music. When the brain is in a stressful state, so it doesn't matter that maybe emotionally we're responding to this music. Yeah, we like how this, yeah, oh yeah, you know. But our brain is actually being assaulted, okay? It's saying regardless if the listener likes or dislikes the music, when the brain is in a stressful state, it will release opioids, a group of hormones that function like morphine to help return itself to normal equilibrium. So what's happening is where the brain and the physiology that we each have is sensing that it's being uh, assaulted and agitated. And as a result, the two hemispheres, if you will, it, this is actually what happens, come out of balance and they're agitated one with another. The body's like, whoa, what's, what's, what's attacking? What's, what's assaulting us? And so it releases this hormone that acts like morphine. And guess what happens? Ah, ah, whew, okay. So even if we're listening to hard music, we're actually getting a morphine hit. In fact, that's what happens. These opioids, when experienced often enough, can be addicting. And the listener seeks for the, quote, high again. This is why listeners tend to move from less to harder music. It starts with soft rock, and you get that, oh, because it's still agitating. It's soft. No. Fit Maybe emotionally and orally, we're saying, oh, that's softer music. But neurologically speaking and physiologically speaking, it's actually still perceived as an assault. The brain doesn't like it. And there's reasons why, which we can't get into today, but we get into it in the 12-hour version of the seminar. So 
what happens is you get this stress and, and we're being assaulted and we release this morphine, this, this, these opioids. So the problem is what happens is over time we become addicted to this feeling and we go from less music to harder music to get the same effect. On top of this, the steady drum rhythms release in the body gonadotrophins, which are sex hormones, which enhance sexual arousal. Now, as a Christian, should we be careful with what we allow into our bodies? Let's say you could take a drug and it enhanced sexual arousal. There are some out there. Now, if you are a single man, would it be wise for you to be popping those pills? Yes or no? No. If you're a young person, would it be wise to let your teenagers pop the pill and they walk around sexually aroused? Guess what? Music, wrong kinds of music, is the pill. And if we're listening to the wrong kinds of music with the heavy drums and syncopation and the rhythms, which we're going to get into in just a moment, it will release not only the, that, that opioid uh, and uh, have that morphine hit, it will also release the gonadotrophins. So here we have young people who are saying, keep yourself pure, but we allow them to listen to stuff that imbues them chemically with sex hormone. It's, it's, music can be your best friend, or it can be your worst enemy. Are you getting that? Does that make sense? Okay. Continuing on. Loud, booming bass music has a similar effect, and it's no wonder that adolescent males prefer these types of music. They're either stimulating a release of brain chemical, stimulating hormones, or both. Eh, my children, 12 and 14. My children don't get to listen to this junk. No way. It's hard enough to be a Christian in this 2012. It is. Have you figured that one out? It's tough. It's, it's much harder to be raised as a Christian today as, than it was just 10 or 20 years ago. I mean, you realize 20 years ago, there's no internet. Now with my smartphone, I can look at and, and listen to anything and everything I want right through the airwaves. The Prince of the Power of the Air wave. And that's it. Now, from this point forward, it's mostly playing music, starting back Elvis Presley, the Beatles, and a whole lot of people. But I use him because he lets you make the decision. Here's this, here's this, make the decision. Now, I take what we study today, we work with a lot of depressed people, right? They go up and then they go down. Their life, is on a roller coaster. They walk by 2 Corinthians 5, 7. They, we should walk by and not by, I'll change sight to feelings and emotions. Is it okay to say that? <laughs> you're, you're, you're influenced by what you see, what you feel, your emotions, and they change how often? Come on, I'm human. Every day. Days I don't feel like getting out of bed. I don't feel like getting out of bed. I don't feel like washing the dishes when it's exacerbated to the point where you can't get out of the bed in the morning, they just define it as debilitating depression. Now, Hebrews 11:6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You gotta walk by faith, not your feelings. If you have music that influences your emotions and your feelings, you're endangering your faith. That is a biblical mathematics. I know because I used to be a rocker. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah. In fact, Addie and I used to listen to some of the same things, right? I, I just want an example. Meatloaf. Meatloaf. You ever heard of, yeah, Meatloaf? I got that thing. And uh, the, the song, I don't know if you ever heard that thing. But this guy, he is talking about a sexual encounter. And the music revs up with his emotions and in the process it revs you up doesn't it come on doesn't it it has that it has that effect and so you can say uh you you are marcy argues this more argue we argue this that and the other but i like christian berdahl because he says does this and he plays it does it change your feelings and emotions and you've got to say yes come on yes now we had a precious sister in the class from africa about three years ago and I was giving study to voodoo music. And I said, I'm about to play some voodoo music. 
And she said, you're going to play that in a Bible class? And I said, yes. She said, I don't think you should. And I said, I have reservations about playing it. But the difference between talking about it, because everything Christian Berdahl said was theory until he played the music. This is what he thought. And some say this, and, some, and he brought an expert in with a book. So what? You can get experts to write all kinds of books. He said it all, right? All the theory. And then it was practice. Now you listen to this. Close your eyes, and you tell me what you feel. And we all felt the same thing. And some of us are different cultures, different places, different backgrounds. Come on, you feel the same thing. I've been in dozens of countries, and the music is the same all over. Give me the difference. Come on, what's the difference of reggae down in Jamaica or R&B in New York? Am I, am I, now, let me, two or three things, and I'm done. We had a man in our class, again, two, three, four, five years ago. He was from Caribbean. He loved R&B music. And so the class, six, seven, eight hours long, at the end of it, he said, no, I, I don't. I disagree. I love that. I still love this. It's fine. Joshua twenty four fifteen. You choose ye this day. You choose your own music. The point and the purpose of health evangelism is to educate the public, whether it's an egg with two hundred thirty four milligrams of cholesterol, or you know Mick Jagger singing "Sympathy with the Devil." Right? Oh. Right? If that's yeah. yeah. I was at a, a Barry White concert. Barry White. <laughs> <laughs> that dates you. <laughs> at the Royal Albert Hall in London. Yeah. And at one point in the concert, and I was surprised by how many British people, this, it was sold out. Yeah. Oh, yes. And at one point in the concert, he had people stand up and say what song they were playing when their child had been conceived. Yeah. Yeah. That's his music. Yeah. Love music <laughs> yeah it, it it indents on your memory even wow. for me a first date what was playing don't want to tell you <laughs> but you come on it's it's that's why, I'm right. that's why i know come on we all relate because again everybody has been was born in trespass and sin you're dead spiritual when you're born that's pre-conversion and the musical taste of somebody that's unconverted is worldly. Am I, is that true? A worldly person loves worldly music. If you had played for me uh, Amazing Grace when I was a rocker, what's, what's wrong with you? You know, Or Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus? Uh, that's not what my cup of tea. Again, I liked and think about before you were converted the kind of music you liked. And whether it's Barry White or whatever your cup of tea. And he launches into a study on this. And he talks about EMI, different record companies. And, and again, he says it theory. Who cares what Christian Bird all says? But when it comes to the rubber meeting the road, I like the studies he does. Mm -hmm. By the way, I worked with him in Ukraine. He's a nice guy. Yeah. Nice guy. Funny, kind of a funny guy. We had our, our lunch in a restaurant. They played this, this really... This really... This real song. <laughs> and Christian Bird looked at me. He said, well... He said, then they played the second song. He said, if that first one didn't destroy all our frontal lobe, the second one will take care of what it left. <laughs> he, was nice, he was a nice guy, nice guy. But he, uh, he, he, he shows, and he plays both. He said, they have the, uh, this cup of tea for people that like the Beatles, right? I want to hold your hand and all that. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't like the Beatles, he's got Mick Jagger, same record company. Mm -hmm. they, they will reach you with one or the other. Barry White, Ozzy Osbourne. You know, they got something for you. Black Sabbath or uh, yes. You know, those are the groups I used to listen to when I was, you know, in my 20s and things. ACDC. ACDC on, yeah, they got, and, and I've got something from ACDC and Black Sabbath both. But it's just it, the mind. Now, the Lord finds you, found Mark, found you, found right, and He wants to bring you into His church. How is He going to clean that music out of your mind? Because you can't have two musics in one mind. Can you? No, can you get up in the morning and sing Amazing Grace and then sing Sympathy with the Devil? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> you can, let me change that. Can you have a mind that loves God and loves the devil at the same time? I mean, now, out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth will, I'll say sing, same thing. Sing, speak. And, uh, and so uh, I play something for that, that sister from Africa, nice lady, she's a nice, beautiful Christian. 
I played it, and then uh, and then made some observations, and you can't deny it once you hear it. You argue about music and lyrics, Sandy Patty and all the rest. They argue all day long. But all you need to do is let him play three things. How does this music make you feel? Eek! The case closed. And that's why I use him. I use Ivor Myers because he was a rapper born in Jamaica and a lot of success. He talks about, he calls his testimony, Escape from the Black Hole. How God, yeah, have you seen that? It's excellent. How God, I, I cut it down just to, the, to just to the rapping part. I don't put it, I take 10 minutes of it. How God got him out of that rapper's mindset and into the church. And it's very interesting if you haven't heard the story. And then uh, a couple of other things. So it's a different, from different people. Christian Berdahl was in L.A. as a dancer and a singer. Not a, not a Christian at all. Mm -hmm. And the Lord pulled him into the church, right? Got him out of the, into the boat, pulled him out of the water. Ivor Myers, a rapper, out of the water and into the boat. And then two or three other people I use. And they're also different in what they say. I'm sorry, they're different in their background. Mm -hmm. But the message they give is the same because it's biblical. And if it's biblical, they ought to all be saying the same thing. Because if you're not, then something ain't right because the Bible does not contradict itself. So tomorrow we start with, uh, you'll see tomorrow, I'll pray. All right, our Father in Heaven, we're thankful for uh, the simple science of music and melody. And we know worship has uh, occupies a place up there in the kingdom of God. Prepare our minds down here that we might sing up there. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Music. Yeah. What was the title of uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. 